And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Thank you very much for that warm welcome. <clears throat> it always makes me nervous when the sister has the microphone. <laughs> but she does a great job. Well, how many of you did you get a good night's sleep last night? I hope that you did. We had a long evening last evening, and we're going to have a good day today talking about a lot of different areas related to, to marriage and everything. We're going to uh, have a stand-up break here in just a little bit, then a big break in the middle of the morning. Then another stand-up break later on. We have four sessions this morning. Then we're going to let you break for lunch. And we're going to come back this afternoon at 1 o'clock, and I'm going to talk about finances and communication and conflict resolution, and finally, with the subject of sexual fulfillment in marriage. We're going to begin this morning by talking about understanding and meeting your spouse's needs. Now, you know, men and women are just totally different as it relates to the needs that we have in marriage. Now, this is a little deal that I... I read one time, you've, you've probably heard this before, but it's scary how, how true it is. It says, what is a cat and what is a dog? Now, you may have seen this. And it asks the question, what is a cat? It says, cats do what they want. They rarely listen to you. They're totally unpredictable. They whine when they're not happy. When you want to play with them, they want to be alone. When you want to be alone, they want to play. They expect you to cater to their every whim. They're moody. They leave their hair everywhere. They drive you nuts and cost an arm and a leg, and the conclusion is they're tiny little women in fur coats. <laughs> you ever heard that? <laughs> I heard some hissing on that one. What is a dog? Dogs lie around all day sprawled on the most comfortable piece of furniture in the house. They can hear a package of food opening half a block away, but they don't hear you but they don't hear you when you're in the same room. They can look dumb and lovable all at the same time. They growl when they're not happy. When you want to play, they want to play. When you want to be alone, they want to play. They are great at begging. They will love you forever if you rub their tummies. They leave their toys everywhere. They do disgusting things with their mouths and then try to give you a kiss. Conclusion, they're tiny little men in little fur coats. So... It's scary. It's scary. Then I've got, the, my, my friend Robert Morris gave me this. This is for men. It's, uh, the difference is now in men and women. The advantages of being a man, phone conversations are over in 30 seconds flat. A five-day vacation requires only one suitcase. You can open your, all your own jars. You can go to the bathroom without a support group. Oh, yeah. Leave the motel bed unmade. Kill your own food. Your underwear is $10 for a three-pack. <laughs> Things like that. Uh, your car mechanic tells you the truth. Uh, you, don't, you don't mooch off others' desserts. Um, if other guys show up in the same outfit, you might become lifelong friends. Things like that. One wallet, one pair of shoes, one collar for all seasons. You can do your nails with a pocket knife. <laughs> Little things like that. So anyway, we're very different. And so in this session this morning, I want to talk about the differences between men and women and how to understand and meet your spouse's needs. And so now, there, there are certain needs in your life that your spouse cannot meet. We talked about that in one of the previous sessions when I was telling you that the deepest needs in your life can only be met by Jesus Christ, by a personal relationship with Him, the encounter 
of Jesus with the woman of the well of Samaria, it revealed the fact that she was empty and she was expecting people to fill a void in her life that only God can fill. Now we need to understand, there's a Jesus-sized hole on the inside of us that no person can fill. Only Jesus can fill that void. And when He fills that void, it fills us up truly and it enables us to love other people the way that God designed. But even if you have Jesus in your life and you're fulfilled in your relationship with Him, we need other people. God said it's not good for man to be alone. We have certain needs. Men and women have certain needs in our life. And it's extremely critical in marriage that we meet each other's needs. One of the reasons this is so important to meet each other's needs is it creates and maintains the attraction and intimacy and passion of the relationship. When you ask a person how good their marriage is, and they say they have a great marriage, what they are really saying is, my needs are getting met. But when you have a person and you ask them how good their marriage is and they say, my marriage isn't good, they're telling you my needs are not getting met. One person may be getting their needs met to a certain degree in marriage and the other person is not getting their needs met at all. It's not a good marriage. It's not a good marriage until both people are getting their needs met. The other thing that is so dangerous about not meeting each other's needs is, is it maximizes the risk of affairs uh, during a marriage lifetime statistically. 50% of all men have affairs and 30% of all women do. And so this this is devastating to a marriage relationship. There's never an excuse for affair under any circumstances. No one can ever blame an affair on someone or justify it somehow. But I'll tell you this, when needs are met in a marriage relationship, it minimizes the risk of the devil coming in and taking opportunity. In 1 Corinthians 7, where Paul tells us that we do not have authority over our own body, but our spouse does for the, for the use of our body to meet their needs. He says, if you fast sex, some people for spiritual purposes might say, you know, for a certain period of time, I'm going to withdraw from all sensual pleasures and not have sex. And that was true back in Paul's day. And what Paul says is, if you do that, you do that for a short amount of time, lest the devil tempt you. He understood the power of unmet needs. And so in your relationship, when you're meeting each other's needs, it's a powerful thing to attract you together and to minimize any attraction outside of the relationship. When you're not meeting each other's needs, it's a very, very dangerous thing to happen in the marriage relationship. So let me me first of all talk, before I talk specifically about a man's needs and a woman's needs, I'm going to talk about, these are the three major problems that most people find in meeting each other's needs. And the first is rejection of the inherent differences between people of the opposite sex. And so, you know, men and women get married, and what happens is we are so different. The four major needs of a man are completely different than the four major needs of a woman. Now, I was attracted to Karen when we we met, and when we married, I was very attracted to her. But I'll tell you, she drove me crazy because... She was just completely different than me. I mean, everything that I wanted, she didn't want. Every, everything that was normal to me was not normal to her. And I'll just tell you, I just thought she was weird. That's, and I told her that. I said, Karen, you're just weird. And so what happened was I, I spent the first several years of our marriage, number one, shaming her for being normal. I didn't know it was normal. I just thought she was very strange. I grew up with, with two brothers and my dad and, and my mother, and I just, you know, I never really understood women very well, and, and my brothers were the closest to me. I just didn't understand what women were like, and so I, I was just shocked. Most people take the energy that God gave them to love each other to try to change each other. And really and truly, while we're dating, and we see these differences in our spouse, a lot of times what we do is we kind of smile, and, you know, just we think, well, oh, that's cute. But really on the inside, we're thinking the life expectancy of that's about three minutes once we get married. I'll put up with it now just, to, just until we get hitched, but I'm going to change that in you. And what happens is when you try to change the unchangeable, damage always happens. There are certain things that are unchangeable. God has created men the way He has created men. He has created women the way He has created women. It's unchangeable. It's the creation of God. You, you cannot change them. And in an effort to change each other, we damage each other. And here's, here's also the problem. When when I get a couple in counseling, what happens is he has been telling her for months or years what his needs are. She doesn't understand it. 
uh, he has been telling her what his needs are. She doesn't understand it. And they're sitting there and they're frustrated and they both feel rejected. And I'll tell you why you feel rejected. When I tell you what my needs are and you reject that, you just rejected me. And when I tell you what my needs are and you tell me that's weird, you just called me weird. And this is what most people do when they get married. Because you're not like me, because you don't feel the way I feel and have the same exact desires that I have, there must be something wrong with you and I am on a holy mission from God to change you. And if you would just listen, it would be so easy. But you keep arguing with me. You keep telling me all these things that, that I know are so strange. And what happens is, it's just this vicious cycle of headbutting that goes on in marriages. And what people do, many people do, is they end up disillusioned, they get a divorce, and they think, well, I'm going to go marry someone else. And I'll tell you, this person was so strange, I'm going to go find another one. I want to tell you, you can change models, but under the hood, they're all the same. The basic equipment that God has given us as men and women is the same. And as I've done these seminars now for, for many years across the country to many thousands of people, I'm telling you, people are the same. Women are the same and men are the same. And when we respect that, we can have a wonderful marriage. When you don't understand it or respect it, it you're just going to have a hard time. The, the second thing that is the problem in us being able to meet each other's needs is translating of our needs of our spouse's needs into our own language. Now, let me just give you an example. So, you know, men listen a certain way and women listen a certain way. Well, one of the needs that a woman has now is for non-sexual affection. And I'll talk about that more in just a minute. I mean, it's a deep need for, for women. Men don't understand that. I mean, it's just, it's just not one of our needs. You just never see a group of men hanging around saying, would somebody hold me? You know, <laughs> unless they're just strange men. And we don't like those kind of men. And but, but, but one of a man's greatest needs is sex. Now, this, this is so crazy. When This is true. A survey was done of women, and they asked women how important sex was to them, and they ranked it 13th, and 12th was gardening. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, you know, when men are asked that same question, it's always one or two. I mean, maybe three, but it's always top on a man's list. How could a woman... Just not desire sex like that. How could a man, you know, not want to be held? He, he's just, there's something not right. No, that's just the way we are. We're different. And what happens is, is that a, a, a husband will come to his wife and he will say to her, honey, I need sex. And well, she thinks he's a pervert anyway. And so, you know, when I get these couples back in, in pre-marriage counseling, I started in ministry uh, helping couples prepare for marriage in pre-marriage counseling, and I would get them back, you know, after a while that they were married, and, and after I would, you know, interview them, they would say, one of the things they said, you know, six months later, a year later, is, is he would say, she's a prude, and he would, she would say, he's a pervert. I mean, he just wants sex all the time. Well, you know, that's just the way it is. So, so she thinks he's, he's, he wants sex too much anyway, and he says to her, hey, let's have sex, and she translates that into her language, and what she's thinking is what he really needs. I know what he's saying, but what he really needs is just to be held. He, he just needs some romance. He just needs some soft light. He needs to slow down. And he just needs conversation. <laughs> little soft Barry Manilow music. <laughs> little candlelight. That's what he needs. And he says, no, sister, I need sex. <laughs> Pure and simple. It just doesn't get any more complicated than that. But then, but then she comes up to him... And she says, thing, this is just something men don't understand. I'm just saying, she comes up to him and says, can, can you just hold me? I just need to be held. Well, see, he, there's not a cell in a man's brain that understands that. <laughs> and so she's, she's saying the truth. She needs that. That's one of her needs. But he translates it into his language, and he thinks she's coming on to me. <laughs> you know. I mean, who can blame her? You know. And he starts grabbing her in a sexual way, and she's slapping his hand. Saying, I just want, I just want to be held. He goes, what? What do you mean you just want to be held? That's, there's something wrong with that. So what happens is we translate it into our own language. And you know, a lot of people just get frustrated, and they think, you know, why, why did God do this to us? You know, why did He make us so different? Why did He make men so sexual, you know, and non-emotional? And why did He make women non-sexual like that? 
and so emotional. Well, let, me, let me just give you an example, because I tell you, God's brilliant in this, the way that he did it. But, but you know, you, you really can't understand it in our unisex culture. You have to go back a ways. Let's just go back several hundred years ago. Let's just imagine for just a minute Daniel Boone, when, when he was, you know, living on the earth. And, and Daniel Boone wakes up in the morning, and he and his wife are very different, obviously, in the task that they have back then. He's going to protect and provide, and she's going to nurture and care. I mean, that's basically the way that God made us. And so they, uh, they have their, their deal going, you know, and they're... He wakes up in the morning, and he's very different. And so he takes his rifle, and he's going to go out, fight Indians, or he's going to go out and, and shoot food or whatever he's going to do. But he leaves the house that morning. He's walking through the field, you know, and Daniel Boone stops and, and just says, Look at this nice stuff here. It made great potpourri on the coffee table. Oh, that's, that's just so wonderful. It smells so good out here. Oh, and then he sees a deer, and he stops, and he pulls his rifle up, and he... He's just about to pull the trigger, and he starts crying. He says, that could be Bambi's mother. <laughs> I just can't pull the trigger. No, that's not the way it is. He walks out the door. He doesn't look at any of the potpourri. He doesn't smell smells anything like that, and he sees a deer, and it could be Bambi himself. <laughs> hey, great cartoon. Boom! You're dead. You're mine. I take you home. And then he, he shoots the deer. Well, why did God make him so sexual? It's so he'll go home after he shot the deer. <laughs> Otherwise, he's sitting out in the middle of the pasture eating that deer thinking, ah, I forgot something. I can't remember what... <laughs> oh, yeah, home. Oh, gosh. He's very sexual. He keeps being drawn back home by the power of his sexual needs. Well, now she's at home, and she's, you know, she's not thinking sexual thoughts. She's really not. Men can understand that because they think about sex so often. God made them that way to draw them back to their wife, not to, not to draw them somewhere else, but to draw them back to their wife. But she's not really thinking sexual thoughts. Men can understand that. She's at home, and she's thinking about you know, Martha Stewart's new collection or... You know, the house and the kids. She's very, she's very wired in. Why? Well, God made her non-sexual so she'll be faithful while he's gone. While he's protecting and providing, she's really not there thinking about sex. She's thinking about that. Well, why did, why did she, God make her so emotional? It's so when he comes home, she can connect him to the emotions of the family. He was disconnected from those emotions so he could go out and shoot Bambi's mother. But he comes home and she says, Johnny broke his arm and, and Mary got a bad grade on a report card and, and Tommy this. And, and she starts putting him in touch with all the emotions. It's, it's like he's drifting out from the ship and she's pulling him in saying, you're coming back in. The mothership is calling you home. <laughs> and she's wired emotionally and she pulls him in. Listen to this. This is an interesting thing. Men are put in touch with their emotions through sex. And women are put in touch with sex through their emotions. That's the way that God's made us. You say, why would God do what He did? He did what He did so that we could both fulfill the function in our life properly and we could both put each other in touch with a world that we're not in touch with if we respect each other. And that's exactly what happened with Karen and me. Whenever we began to respect each other and stop arguing with one another, she put me in touch with a world I didn't know existed. And I did the same for her. So whenever, whenever you translate your spouses, when you reject it, you reject them. But when you translate it into your own language, what you're saying is, I don't believe that you're legitimate. I don't believe that you need to be held. I don't believe that you need sex. You need what I need. No, we don't. We both have different sets of needs, and then we need to understand that. Here are the four major needs of a man in how to meet them. And the reason I'm starting here. Ladies, is because this is where the Bible starts. I want to read from Ephesians 5 for just a minute. There are four basic needs that a man has, and we'll talk about that, then take our break and come back and talk about the four major needs of women and how a husband can meet those needs. The four major needs of a man and how to meet them. Number one need of a man is honor. Now, I want to read from you, for you, Ephesians Five And beginning now, this verse 21 says, Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Verse 22, Wives, submit your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, and as also Christ is head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. 
Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, this is a very controversial uh, scripture, and, and women really resent being told to submit to their husbands, and I really don't blame them, because it's typically said in a very demeaning way. I, I want to go back to a statement that I made earlier. Women are absolute equals in God's sight. In Genesis chapter 2, when you see the creation taking place, and God created men and women in marriage, there is never a reference to authority there. But many men now look to Ephesians 5, and they say, see there, God's telling you to submit to me. Well, the verse right before where it tells women to submit their husbands, the verse right before that says, submit to one another in the fear of Christ. That we're all supposed to have an honoring spirit to one, one another. That's all it's talking about here is having an honoring spirit. And then it says toward women, it says, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Well, what, that, what that's saying is brilliant. A lot of people look at this and they say, yeah, that's just a religious scripture. And, and uh, you know, wives submit to your husbands and husbands do this. You know, let me tell you what this is. This is the key to your spouse's heart. If, if we would listen to what Paul is saying, did you know that this is the most revelatory description of marriage in the entire Bible, Old Testament, New Testament? Ephesians 5 is the only time in the entire Bible we're shown the mystery of marriage from the very beginning. And the Apostle Paul comes here and, and he writes the scripture and he says, Women, let me give you now the secret of your husband's heart. Treat him just like you would Jesus. And, and what the devil does is he takes that and interprets it and says, God's putting you down. He's trying to make you into a second class citizen. He's trying to oppress you. Women are oppressed. And there's no doubt about the fact that women have been oppressed and abused for, for as long as men have been around. There's no doubt about that. But understand this. God made men a certain way, and it's unchangeable. You, you cannot change it. The only thing you can do is respect it to succeed. Well, how did God make men? God made man in His image, and the first thing that He needs is praise. Men are more sensitive in the area of their egos than women can possibly comprehend. Now, I have a, a daughter and I have a son. My daughter, Julie, and my wife, Karen, are both very sensitive people. My daughter, Julie, literally, I've never met a person more physically sensitive than my daughter. She'll be walking past me and I'll just grab her here on the arm because I want her to come back and hug me. And just grabbing her there, she'll say, oh, Dad, that hurts. And I just can't, I can't comprehend it. How, how tender she could be. My son, Brent, is 6'4", and I mean, he lifts weights. And... There was a long time when he was growing up there that, you know, we'd wrestle around and things like that, and I'd try not to hurt him. Well, then, when he got about in the 10th or 11th grade, and he was lifting weights and he was in sports, I remember the day that I realized it was a fair fight. <laughs> That's, I immediately started on an exercise program. <laughs> but then I remember the day that I realized it wasn't a fair fight. And he said, Dad, we were wrestling in the room, and Karen was yelling at us because we were going to break something. And he said, Dad, I'm going to move you across the room and push you against that back wall. And I said, you and what army? And two seconds later, I was saying it against the wall. <laughs> he took me and shoved me. And what happens is we slug each other. And, uh, and I walk, I mean, I could hit him in his arm as hard as I can possibly hit him. And he'll say things like, is there, are there mosquitoes in here? <laughs> uh, you know, it really bugs me. I can't hurt him. I mean, I can't hurt the child. So my daughter... My daughter is so tender, and my son is so strong. Can I tell you something? That's the opposite for men and women emotionally. Women are very tough emotionally. They, they really are. You know, you hear women talking to each other. Women, women just really have a lot of toughness emotionally that men don't have. You notice men almost always talk about super, superficial things. Men, men rarely will just open their emotions and talk. Women just, boom, that's how they do with each other emotionally, you know. Hi, right, Katie, boom, like that. And Katie goes, boom, like that. They just don't hurt each other. It's like a couple of men slugging each other. But men, you don't see that. Men, it's like, hi, Bob. <laughs> How's the weather, Bob? Like your new truck, Bob. It's just, we're so careful because we are as tender in the area of our emotions as women are physically. And all you ladies in here, you understand how sensitive you are physically? That's the way he is with every word that you say. That's why the Bible says, just like you would treat Jesus, treat him in the same way. Honor him in that same way. Why? It's because he's better than you or, or you're supposed to be under him as it relates to significance or equality. No, not at all. It's the key to his heart. It's the only way that you will ever be able to relate to a man 
successfully, any man in your life, even your sons. It's the only way that you can relate to them if you understand their ego and how tender it really is. And so let me, let me just give you some um, tips here on how you can practically meet this need in your husband's life. And the first thing is this. If you're going to meet your husband's need for honor, you've got to allow him to fail without fear. Now, most of the damage that I see women doing in marriages is because of fear. The fear of what their husband is doing and what it's going to produce. Now, women are very relational. When, when there's marriage counseling that takes place, 99% of the time it's initiated by women. Women are just, they, they really are incredible in the area of relationships. But women have one major flaw relationally, and it's fear. Uh, the 1 Peter 3, where it talks about Abraham and Sarah, it says, ladies, you are children of faith, the daughters of Sarah, if you do what is right without being frightened with any fear. Because God knows that fear is what happens. Your husband begins to do something financially or with the kids or practically. And what Satan does, you know, Satan is a prophet. And when anything happens in your life, Satan comes and he prophesies the end result of that. He wants to show you the end in, in the dark version of it. And he says, if your husband keeps doing this, this is what's going to happen. And he prophesies to you. That's what fear is. Fear is a demonic spirit of prophecy from the devil. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God has not given us a spirit of fear. It never comes from God. God gives us faith. What does that mean? I have faith. If I do the right thing to my husband, God will change his heart. I don't have to react to my husband constantly if I, if I allow him to fail. Does that mean that you don't say anything? Ladies, you have the absolute right to say anything you want to say in the marriage. If, if you think your husband is wrong, you have the absolute right to say that you think he's wrong. If you have a different opinion, you have the absolute right to, to state that opinion. And I don't believe that any man should dominate his wife. I think you should be equal partners in whatever happens. But let's just say you state your opinion and he doesn't listen to it. Let me ask you a question then. Who becomes the enforcer? If you say that you think he's wrong, if you say that you disagree with something, and this spirit of fear is coming to you saying, he's going to ruin the kids, he's going to bankrupt you, he's going to do this, he's going to do this, he's going to do this, showing you the worst possible conclusion of what's going on. This, this prophetic spirit from hell that wants to destroy your life. And you, you're listening to that, that spirit of fear and you see what your husband's doing. And you go to your husband and you honorably say to him, I, I disagree with what's happening. And I just want you to know that this and this and this and this and I love you. Let me say this. If you try to enforce what you just said through browbeating, through withdrawal of sex, through punishment in any way, through dishonor, you will do more damage than he would do if you let him fail. If you would let him fail, you would do less damage than if you try to prevent him from failure. And here's what happens. This is what I tell ladies all the time. And this is not just true for ladies, it's true for anyone. You know, like when your children, you're raising your children, there's so much control that you can have over your children, any age children. There's just so much control that you have. What, what about when you're disciplining your children and you're standing against your children and things aren't happening the way you should? If you cross the line with your children and try to force immediate results all the time, you'll break the spirit of that child. What do you do? When I've done everything I can do, I get in my prayer closet. And I get in my prayer closet and I hit my knees and I say, God, change their heart. Rather than fear being the motivation, faith is the motivation. If I, do the, if I honor my husband anyway, and if I trust God to change his heart, I have faith like Sarah had faith. Remember, Abraham sold Sarah to another man two times through his line. Two times Abraham was confronted. See, a lot of people say, well, if I was married to Abraham, I could act that way, but I'm married to Leon here, and he's about to kill me. Well, how many times has Leon given you up to somebody else? Because Abraham two times lied and said that Sarah was his sister and not his wife. And in both cases, almost got somebody killed. Abraham had problems. Abraham had a habitual problem with lying to save his own life. Rather than standing up for his wife to protect her honorably, Abraham gave her up out of fear. But she honored him anyway. And the Bible says you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. Every time your husband makes a mistake, you have a decision to make. How am I going to respond? You have every right to say something. You have every right to state your opinion. But how are you going to state it? And understand, he's as tender 
in, in the area of his emotions as you are physically. So every word you say to you could just be an incidental word of, well, I, that's wrong. But the volume and the force of that, you don't understand, would be like a punch in your arm. It's, it's devastating to him to be dishonored. It's devastating to him to be talked to that way. And when you understand that, you understand, okay, he's doing something wrong. I'm going to state my opinion because I should. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to be polite and honorable in front of him. And then I'm going to get on my knees in my prayer closet and I'm going to cry out to God and say, God's sick him. God, keep him from destroying this family. God, break his heart. Make him a man of wisdom. And that's, that's where you get violent in your prayer closet and before him be honorable, not the other way around. It's so important that ladies understand this because I'll tell you, again, women are extremely relational, wonderful in marriage, but the fatal flaw for so many women is a spirit of fear that motivates every single thing they do rather than the faith that says, if I do the right thing, God will honor it. The right thing is always to honor your husband. Secondly, honor him where you want him to be not where he is. It's called the cork principle. Corks rise, if you put a cork in a vessel and fill it with water, that cork will rise to the level of the water always. If there's no water, it lays on the bottom. If you never praise your husband, if you don't honor your husband until he deserves it, he doesn't get any honor. And so the cork is laying on the bottom. But it says in Proverbs 31 that there's this woman now, and it says that this woman... Her husband is an elder in the gates of the city. But realize this, it attributes it to her, not to him. The Proverbs 31 woman, it says her husband is an elder in the gates of the city. What happened, I'm sure, in that scenario was she married a normal man who made normal mistakes. But rather than treating him the way he deserved, she treated him the way she wanted him to be. She honored him as an elder when he wasn't one. And because she gave him more honor than he deserved, his behavior rose to that level. Let me, let me ask you a question now. This is of every person here. How many of you are motivated by criticism? How many of you are, are motivated to do better by someone who's constantly critical of you? But how many of you are motivated by praise? When I was growing up and I had coaches, when I had a football coach or a baseball coach or a basketball coach who praised me, and gave me positive affirmation, I would break my neck for that coach. But when I had a coach who ragged on me and criticized me all the time, I would never do anything for that coach. We're all the same way. If you want your husband to do better, praise him at the level that you want him to be. Number, number three, cover his faults and reflect his strengths. Now, when cover, I say cover his faults, I'm not saying cover uh, destructive behavior. If he's abusive or if he's you know, destroying himself on alcohol or something. I'm saying, you know, you need to do the, the appropriate thing in those times. But every, every husband has problems. Don't go around your friends and talk about your husband. Don't go around your family members and talk about your husband. Don't, don't criticize him publicly. It'll be devastating to him. And I, and I say this, and I mean it. If the only thing your husband does right is button his pajamas properly. You know, there are only three buttons normally on pajamas. Pretty simple. Then, then what you do is, is that every night, that's the only thing he does right. Rather than focusing on everything he did wrong, just get all the family together and he walks out of the bedroom and you say, your, your dad's a genius. <laughs> Kids, nine nights out of ten, he gets it right. I mean, this, this is amazing. And you just praise him and praise him and I'll just tell you, he'll live in his pajamas. He'll never take them off. He'll just walk around. He'll walk in front of you. Yeah, he just, men gravitate to the place they get the most honor and they stay away from the places they get the most dishonor. You say, well, why does my husband work all the time? Well, maybe there's somebody up there praising him. Why does my husband golf or fish all the time? Maybe there's somebody out there who likes him. But I'll tell you this, if you fill your home full of praise and honor, he'll be in your presence. Psalm 22 says, God inhabits the praises of his people and men inhabit the praises of their wives. You can't keep them away from an honoring woman. Men want a cheerleader. They want to be married to someone who believes in them the most. Again, you're as equal. You have every right to say how you feel. But how you say it is so critical because his number one need is the need of honor and significance. Number two is sex. And I'm going to talk about this more in a later session. And I've already said this, and that is men have a much more profound 
need for sex than women do. And it's just basically true. And I realize there are stages in life, and when men get older, many times women can become equally as sexual later in life as men are. In fact, sometimes women are even more sexual than their husbands. So we always ought to be committed to meeting each other's uh, sexual needs, regardless of who has the more, more profound need. But men reach their sexual peak at age 20. Most women reach their sexual peak at about age 40. And so we are very different in this area. And so shame, shaming your husband when he expresses a sexual need or something, it's devastating to him. You know, calling him a pervert or a sicko or anything like that, it's devastating to him. In order for you to meet your husband's sexual need, first of all, you have to let him know that you accept it as normal, that you realize that's, that's a normal thing that God put in him. And secondly, that you commit to him. I am going to meet this need in you. I realize it's a legitimate need and an important need, and I am going to meet this, this need in you. The men are different in the area of sex than women are. And let me just tell you one difference here, and I'll go on, and I'm going to cover the rest of this material now uh, when I talk about sex later on today. But the men are very visual as it relates to, to sex. Men are visually stimulated. Women are more emotionally stimulated. Now, women aren't blind related to attractiveness, but men are very visually stimulated. You know, the, the, the lingerie industry is not for women because most women are ashamed of their own bodies. Ninety percent of all fashion models have low self-esteem, and most of them extremely low self-esteem. And I'll tell you why. Most women compare their bodies to other women's bodies, and also most women have one area of their body that they're ashamed of. It's their hips or it's their breast or something like that. And, and we have a horrible society, and what we do is, on television and movies and magazines and all that, we take these airbrushed, you know, ideal situations, these, these young girls who have not had children or anything like that, and they're, they're young, very young girls, and we take that and we make it the standard, and then men across America try to you know, make their wife feel bad if they don't look like that. Well, you know, very few people look like that. Even the people who look like that don't look like that. <laughs> it takes body makeup and airbrushing and perfect lighting and perfect conditions and everything like that. And, you know, and Karen, my, you know, we're, we're older and she's had children. And, and I'll tell you, you know, I know there's some guys who, you know, compare their wives to all these other women out there. And I'll tell you, my, my basic standard is I will not compare Karen to any woman who has not paid the price to have my children. And every mark on her body and every change in her body, I consider it to have enhanced her attractiveness to me rather than decreased it. I think it's horrible for men to compare their wives with other women or to demand this extreme standard of, you know, what's sick anyway in our, in our society. But let's just say men are attracted to women's bodies. Men want to see women naked, period. And the problem with that is women are ashamed, most women are ashamed of their own bodies, and they don't want to show them off. Most women sexually like dark rooms, flannel nightgowns, things like that. They really do. This is a big issue. And he's trying to turn the lights on, you know, and tear everything off, and she's trying to put it back on. And, and she can understand why it would be attracted. I was, I was doing a marriage seminar one time in Pennsylvania, and I, I made the comment. I said, ladies, there's a place for flannel nightgowns. And the man in the audience yelled out, the fireplace. <laughs> He has different needs than you have. He's visually stimulated. And to meet his needs, it means that you affirm his needs and you meet that need in his way. Not violating your conscience or doing something the Bible says don't do, but understanding that he's different than you are. Number three need of a man, kindred fellowship. And that means he wants to have fun with you. You fell in love having fun. And when marriage, you know something, if it, if it weren't for sex and the friendship that we have, marriage is a business relationship. The only thing that keeps marriage from being a business is being friends and having sex. Other than that, it's just a business of raising children, a business of running the home, and a business of getting the clothes cleaned and all that stuff. But friendship, you, you fell in love because you found fun things to do and you did them together. How do you fall out of love? You stop being fun. It's, it's easy sometimes to treat your, your husband as a child because sometimes they act like the children. In fact, sometimes they're encouraging the children to act the way they're acting. And so, you have to remember, he's your husband, and to treat him like that. And the second thing is, is don't become matronly. 
Don't, don't get smothered in the identity of being a mother or something else. Remember, the whole relationship began with the friendship between you. And that means be fun and stay fun. Stay his friend. Go outside your comfort zone to do things with him that you know he enjoys doing. And I'll tell you, I would rather be with Karen than anyone else. Doing anything that I do, I would rather be with Karen. I love to play golf. I would rather play golf with Karen than, than anyone else that I know. I mean, she's, she's just my friend. And so that's, that's a need that men have. And, and lastly is domestic support. Domestic support means support around the home. And uh, making sure that meals and the home and things like that are, are good, that that's something very important to a man. Now, let me say something, and, uh, and that is, I do not believe that a man's job is, is done when he comes home at night. If, if a woman stays home all day, and th- that's her responsibility, it's hard, hard work. And when he comes home, he ought to pitch in. If a woman works all day and comes home, it puts an extra burden on the man to pitch in with housework. Now, I do housework, and I, I help clean the house. I don't cook for health reasons. And... <laughs> I mean, we just, we just don't let me cook. But I, I take the clothes in and put them on top of the washer. Karen does not pick up after me. When I get finished with something, a towel, I put it in the dirty clothes. I take my clothes off, I go put them in the dirty clothes. I, I vacuum, I, I make beds, I, I do things like that. And by the way, this is the truth, guys. There was a survey done of women, and they were asked, when is your husband most sexually attractive to you? Number one response when he's doing housework. Let me just tell you, this, this is the interpretation. God has divined a system to where idiots don't get good sex. <laughs> and so that's the whole thing. So if you're the kind of a guy that you sit around, you want her to slave on you all the time, you're wrong. When I say domestic support, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is women have a gift of turning a house into a home. If, if you let your husband decorate the house, they'll just be Sports Illustrated pictures with staples guns on nails by the doors. You know, men, men just do it, you know, in just a utilitarian manner, the most... But, but Karen, see, our bed has got foo-foo all over it. And I don't understand that. Women nest. You know, they just, they go to stores and they just, they gather all this stuff and they bring it home, little doilies, little pretty things and smell goods and things like that. Men would never think of that stuff. Now, by the way, I had a counseling situation one time with an interior decorator and his wife. He was an interior decorator. Very good, very successful interior decorator. Guess what the subject was? He kept rearranging the furniture. Oh, my gosh. And she said, she said to me, she said, you know, I'm, I mean, I want my house a certain way. He comes home and changes it. And, and he says, in this counseling deal, he says, well, the way you have it is technically incorrect. <laughs> she said, I'll technically incorrect you, pal. <laughs> I love that one. He was willing to chip in. She's going to break his arms. <laughs> she wanted to build that nest the way she wanted it. I'm there to support Karen and to take out the trash and to, and to do the things that I need to do to support her. Every husband should do that. However, women have a gift of turning a house into a home, and men need that gift so that they can come home to that atmosphere. It's a deep need that men have.